So thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and I think very important and inspiring Congress. Uh, embracing uncertainty is really an idea which I think is, is vital and essential to our society. As a sociologist, I'm exactly working on that point because I think we need to have a new relationship to the fact that it is impossible uh, to control the world, right? To uh, turn everything into certainty when we're dealing with our environment. And this is why um, my, the title of my talk is Modernity's Desire for Control and the Return of Uncontrollability in the Shape of a Monster. So the first step is really modernity as a social formation aiming for control over the environment, over society, over nature, over life and so on. Right? And I think uh, this desire for control has two two elements, two aspects. One is cultural, right? We, I, I believe that the dominant uh, conception of the good life and of the good in our Western style society, but they have now become kind of global way of life, right? And the good or the good life in this conception is a life that permanently increases the horizon of what can be made available, attainable and accessible, right? I call it the triple A conception of the good life. And this is the desire to increase the horizon of control, right? Uh, in, in my view, uh, this, th this desire comes in four aspects, right? We want to uh, increase the horizon of what we can see for example, with a, with, a, with a telescope and then with a satellite, we try to make more and more of space visible, right? To get to reach deeper and deeper into space, extending the horizon of availability there. But with microscopes, we want to pierce into matter and to understand uh, matter more uh, specifically, right? And um, uh, this is a kind of general desire uh, which we have, make things visible, see what there is. The second aspect of increasing controllability is that we want to get there with the ships, with the side satellites, with the rockets, with the planes. We want to increase the horizon of where we can go to in geography. But of course, also in how, for example, we want to make the inner organs of our bodies accessible with new medical technology and the inner workings of matter and so on, right? So the first is increasing the horizon of visibility. The second is increasing the horizon of accessibility. And then of course, once we are there, for example, think of, uh, you know, the movement that which led to the imperial and colonial movements all over the world, right? So the Europeans at first started to send their ships all over the earth to see what is there. And then they wanted to, to, to make it accessible, get there, and then trying to get control over the, the territory and the land, right? So the third element of controllability or disponibility is, uh, the, is the, the, the attempt to gain control over things, gain control over the workings of our body, gain control over the workings of matter and, uh, and, and political control and so on. And in the fourth step, of course, we want to use the things we get access to, right? So there is a kind of cultural try, drive to increase the horizon of what we can make available, attainable and accessible. And this, for, by the way, is why money is so attractive in our modern world, right? The more money you have on an individual level, the more you can make available. You can go to places far away. You can buy this expensive car. You can actually afford this great apartment, which is very expensive or so on. If you don't have much money, then all of these things are non-available or attainable to you. And it's the same logic with technology, right? We, we, technology permanently expands the horizon of what you can make available or attainable or accessible. Think of the smartphone, right? With a few clicks, you can make all of your friends available. You can get access to all the music that was ever recorded or to all the knowledge that has ever been written down and digitalized or the movies and so on. So we make more and more of the world, more and more of the things the world has in store, available, attainable and accessible, right? But on the other hand, uh, this is not just a cultural desire to increase the horizon of controllability, availability, attainability, accessibility, but it's also a structural requirement because our modern societies, right, can only uh, maintain the institutional fabric, the institutional order, the status quo through permanent increase. We have to achieve economic growth and accelerate production and consumption and communication and transport and so on 
uh, uh, and we have to be, we have to permanently innovate in order to keep the number of jobs, the companies, and so on, but also to maintain the pension schemes, the healthcare system, the educational schemes, and so on. So this drive to increase domination and control over the world, right, is not just a cultural desire, it's a structural feature of the modern social formation. So really what we what we what we as a, as as a, actually in our kind of world system right um, the modern social formation have established is in a kind of it's a stance of what I call aggression towards the world. We permanently have to increase our hold over nature with extractive industries. We are that it's quite aggressive right you see it in Chile for example quite strongly in 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 the in the desert where we try to extract more and more of earth resources and use them and so on and control them but also in the pollution we see that we have an aggressive stance towards nature and actually we have an aggressive stance in politics too right where people permanently fight those who are obstructions or hindrances to their own control over the world and we even are in aggression towards ourselves because we permanently try to optimize our bodies we, we think we have to gain control over our level of number of steps per day over our sleep over our calorie intakes and so on. So the desire for control is connected to almost the stance of aggression. But now, and this is the second thing I want to tell you, the second step, the, the, the interesting thing, the most interesting thing is that this um, has a paradoxical flip side. By trying to increase control over the world, we actually lose it. Right. Let me give you a few examples. I mean, my main, my favorite example really is the remote control in our hands, right? Which you, you might even have a smartphone or a smart car or so. Uh, but all of us know these situations. We are almost omnipotent with the remote control in our hand. In, in, in the car, for example, or in the flat, I can make it bright light or dark night if I turn out uh, all, the, light, all, all the, uh, the lights. I can make it very hot. By turning on the heater, I can make it very cold by turning on the um, um, the air conditioner. I can play loud music. I can make it totally silent. I can make it blue, green, or red. So I'm omnipotent, omnipotent, right? I, I have an incredible control over my environment. Unless the battery fails or the remote is broken or something is wrong with technology, then I might not be able to close the window anymore. Right? It might stay open all night, even so it's freezing outside. I cannot turn off the heat. It's getting warmer and warmer and the system is not working. Sometimes I cannot even the door. It happened to me in the car once, right? I could not open the door, the car door anymore. So then, so the attempt to have complete control over my environment monstrously turns in a situation of complete powerlessness. I can't do anything here. This is why we start to hate our, our cell phones or remote controls sometimes very much. And in a way, interestingly, this kind of flip side is also and noticeable in politics, I find this most interesting because modern democracies live, of course, on the promise also of popular sovereignty. We have complete political political control over our body politics, over societies, right? There is no power, no church, no God, no king that, that could tell us how to live. So we somehow have acquired complete control, but then we feel completely powerless in the face of the financial markets, for example, or a kind of media storms running uh, havoc, which we cannot control. So there's this flip side of total control and total powerlessness in politics too. But most interestingly, you see it with respect to nature. And I find nuclear power the most interesting example, because when Oppenheimer and his friends uh, developed uh, or recognized how to split the atom, they really felt that we have reached a new stage in our attempt to control the world. They said we have become almost creators, right? In a certain sense, godlike, because now we can control and measure the atom from the inside. But this created the monster of nuclear explosions in the bomb or in a power station, right? And that, of course, is the utter feeling of a loss of control. We feel totally powerless uh, with respect to a, to a nuclear explosion and a nuclear chain reaction, right? And, and now you can expand the picture. Actually, that's our situation in relationship to nature in total. We have come to control it, to dominate it in almost all aspects and respects. But now we realize what we do is we destroy it, right? And with climate change, with global warming, 
we are the powerless victims, right? There's nothing we seem to be able to do against nature if it takes revenge, as some say, right? With uh, tsunamis and uh, hurricanes and, uh, and uh, glaciers melting away and so on. So my claim is there's always this this strange dialectical movement because between increasing our powers of domination and control, increasing the horizon of the available, the attainable and the accessible, and then losing it. And this loss is also felt in our individual lives when we realize we cannot plan our way into the future anymore. The world, the world has become chaotic. And now, and that's the third thing I want to tell you, right? The COVID crisis seems to me to epitomize exactly this situation because the new coronavirus is really the symbol and the symptom of the monster of uncontrollability. Actually, it is a monster of uncontrollability. Why? Well, because we don't have scientific control over it. We have not yet ex explored it. We do not have medical control over it, right? We don't have a vaccine against it. We are starting to develop one now, but it took quite some time. We don't have a medicine to cure it. So we don't have medical control. We don't have scientific and technological control. We cannot politically regulate it. It simply crosses the border and spreads no matter what we do. We feel totally powerless with respect to it. And even in, in we don't have, we, we can't foresee the economic consequences and so on. But when I say uh, that uh, that COVID or the coronavirus is really epitomizing, it's, 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 it's kind of a manifestation of a loss of control, right, of uncontrollability. I also have in mind uh, on an individual level that you, we cannot see it, we cannot hear it, we cannot smell or touch it. So it's really, it's a symptom or it's a, it's, yeah, it's a symptom of a distortion in our way we relate to the world. Our relation to the world, which is normally geared in an aggressive mode towards control, right? Towards making things available, attainable and accessible. This is a kind of, it's perverted by the crisis, by the virus, because we cannot control it. I cannot make it available, attainable and accessible. And it might already be inside my body or in the body of my my, my children or so on and I don't even know it so it's the monster of non-controllability and as such a symbol and a symptom of the things which have gone wrong which are wrong with the modern social formation so what should we do or what can we do about it well this I only have a few minutes left right my idea is we need to have a new relationship towards earth towards the world towards nature even towards ourselves one that is not in an aggressive mode aiming at aiming at control, domination, right? And permanent increase, acceleration, growth, and so on. So what is a different way of relating to, to of relating to the world, right? And I think we all know it. It's what I call a mode of being in resonance with the world, right? When you're in resonance with something, for example, you hear a wonderful melody, or you fall in love with a landscape, or with a person, or with a book you're reading, then you're not aiming at control and domination. You're in a receptive mode of listening, being touched by something. But it's not just passive. It's also active because then you do something with the book you read, for example, or with the music you hear, or with the person you meet. It's not geared towards control and domination. It's in a mode of listening and answering, being touched by something, and then feeling self-efficacy, really feeling alive by reaching out to the other side and doing something with it, getting in an interactive mode, which is kind of open with respect to the result, right? That's the opposite of domination. Those experiences in your life and in my life, which are truly valuable, which are experiences of real life, so to speak, are those where I'm not seeking control and when I don't have control because I meet someone or something that's utterly different and I listen to it and then I do something with it. I react to it. And then it seems like, like in a dance or in playing music together, the music is unfolding in between us. And my, my idea is my vision for the future, right? We are, it's a Congress also about what could the future be is regain a sense and regain a social formation which is in resonance with nature. That does not mean that we simply submit or surrender to the powers of nature and simply follow nature's course. In being in resonance with nature means answering it, right? L listening to what is there, it developing an ethics of, of care, which means preserve 
the things which are valuable, which are speaking to us, but then also reacting to it. And that means changing it in some senses. And I think this idea of resonance can be used for political encounters, listening to those who have other opinions, other beliefs or other policies, and then engage with them, answering them. And that may, can mean that in, certainly includes bitter controversies and conflicts, right? Um, and so I think resonance is, is, is the kind of the yardstick or the measure where we should go for. But of course, this also requires institutional change, because as I have said, the institutional fabric of modernity is geared towards growth, increase, acceleration. So I'm thinking of things like an unconditional basic income, a global debt cut, for example. I think we need this and a global inheritance tax, for example, and the nationalization of finance. So, of course, we need institutional uh, reforms and maybe even revolutions. But we need to keep in mind that what we're looking for is not better and greater control over the world, but a mode of resonance with the world. And I would be very happy if this Congress turns out to be a first step on this road to another, to another and hopefully better social formation. Thanks a lot for listening.